Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to our um, a special talk today. Um, the talk wouldn't have came at a right right time than the time we are we are in now. Um, the the talk for today is titled "The Case for Solar Power in um, Residential Homes Within um, South Africa." Um, I'm your host um, today. Um, um, my name is Ezra Masas Malaji. Um, I'm currently a lecturer at the uh, University of Johannesburg. I obtained my master's degree in 2013 from University of uh, Pretoria. I'm currently pursuing my PhD at University of Johannesburg. Um, my research interests um, are in the field of power system optimization, smart grid, uh, stochastic uh, programming, uh, electric, uh, electricity markets, and uh, transactive um energy um so uh before we start um i would like to just ask to have some housekeeping rules um all um attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on their device ensure you have a stable internet connection this will ensure the streaming and the audio um to run smoothly uh, attendees uh, can ask questions via question panel located within the go to webinar control panel by default the control panel is located on the right hand side of your screen uh, the chat function is reversed uh, reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees and this will not be able to um, chat with each other however um, i encourage to ask questions a recording of the presentation will be made um, available on the SAI channel, SIE TV. The recording will also be made available on the SA website um, page, uh, which is um, uh, updated uh, regularly. So ensure you check back as soon as possible for new uploads and subscribe to the channel. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few weeks after this webinar once we have received the cpd validation number for this webinar from um exa so those are the uh, things to to keep in mind uh, during uh, the webinar so um our speaker for today um our honorable guest it's um um uh, eddie Eddie, uh, let me see, uh, Mr. Eddie um, Mukobodi. Uh, Mr. Mo, uh, Mr. Mukobodi has a BSc um, degree in construction management. Uh, Eddie gained experience working on the construction side of uh, our new coal-fired station, which is Kusile. He has completed a course in uh, IESSA. A relaxed desktop lighting design aim to achieve competence in energy management as well as green building council accredited programs. Eddie is currently uh, an affiliate youth member of the South African National Energy Association, SANIA, Black Energy Professional Association, and South African Energy Efficiency uh, Confederation. Um, so without a waste of um, any time, um, I'm actually going to uh, hand over to our our guest, and then our guest will take through um, the presentation. Uh, Mr. Mukobodi. Afternoon, um, Ezra. Uh, I'm, I'm making you a presenter now, and then good luck. Thank you. I think that should be clear. Is that uh, visible, Ezra? Yes, uh, it is visible. All right. Afternoon, guests. Thank you, Ezra, for that uh, lovely introduction. So my name is Eddie Mukobodi, as Ezra had said, and I'll be taking you through just a high-level overview on the case for solar power for residential homes within South Africa. 
I am the director and founder of Sakisa Energy and Technology Group. And just a little bit about myself. So you saw that image there. With adding on to that, I'm currently doing my master's at Fitz Business School in uh, Energy Leadership. And I'm quite passionate about the industry as well. Just as an aside as well, the reason I started in the world of business was I just found it more exciting to be living on the edge or just taking a few more risks. And hopefully the journey ahead should be great. A bit about the business I represent, Sakisa Energy is a multidisciplinary SMME business in South Africa, and we position to serve the growing needs of the energy sector in Africa. And just some of our contact details are over there, which will also be shared at the end of the slide. We are a member of the South African Electro-Technical Export Council, the Green Building Council, and we are Level 1 BEE as well. Our business is centered around the SDG goal number seven, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, and that's to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. And we are obviously positioned in Africa and out of the 800 million people living on the continent, probably now a lot, a lot closer to a billion, 600 million people still are living without access to electricity. So we located within a developing market with access to the SADC region of Africa and we aim to become the perfect vehicle to effect positive results. So Let's talk about what affects us all. We've got the term load shedding. I believe that's probably unique to South Africa. My friends overseas don't seem to know that word. And we may all be quite familiar with some of these headlines. It's a grim picture that affects us all. We've had dark days ahead. ESCOM's facing a crisis that tends to get worse. Um, more blackouts coming, catastrophic ESCOM silo collapse puts SA in the dark. SA is in the dark ages. Rolling blackouts are back. More city blackouts. Knows, knows that nah, now that's night, I think. <laughs> ESCOM warns of cuts throughout the week after call silo collapses. Power cuts, brace yourself. Black in time. So this isn't quite a positive picture, especially for people who live in homes that rely on electricity, which should be probably the bulk of the South African population. You look at something like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and human beings have a needs hierarchy. If you look at the needs pyramid, we've got your physiological needs, so that's good health, food and sleep. Then as you come up, you've got safety. People want to feel safe, so shelter, clothes, and the removal from danger. As you come up your needs pyramid, you want to feel a sense of belonging. So that's more on the love and affection. And then as you go further up, those needs surrounding esteem, so from yourself and others, and the highest level of needs being self-actualization. With that in mind, where would you place your own energy security? You know, so how important is that to you? How important is it knowing that you can still keep the lights on despite the fact that there may be rolling blackouts around you could it be at the bottom of the pyramid as more important similar to food and sleep or slightly higher ranked in closer to safety people make buying decisions when things move from important to urgent what we've noticed in the marketplace is that energy security has become an urgent prompt behind people's purchasing decisions. The rise in electricity costs, as we are all aware, have also prompted buying decisions. We've noticed within our encounters with general consumers, the increased need for boreholes, that's because of the um, unreliable water supply, gas stoves, solar geysers, solar systems or solar hybrid systems with battery backup 
or just battery backup alone to carry some of the house loads during load shedding. Most consumers we've interacted with have started to feel that their rates and taxes are unjustified as they don't seem to be getting value for money. Then we've got the effects of COVID-19, which has placed more people in their homes. So you now have more people working from home or more people spending more time indoors. And this means you cannot afford to have disruptions within your, with regards to your electricity supply. Just a basic model for a residential solar system. You would have the solar panels on the roof that would bring in direct current. You'd then have your hybrid inverter in the middle that would push out uh, the uh, alternating current to your home appliances. That hybrid inverter would also be linked up to the grid or your utility, which brings in the alternating current. Then you've got the direct current back and forth from your battery bank or your battery setup. And this can then supply your key or selected loads. Solar energy, is it a luxury or is it a necessity? If we had had this discussion pre-2007, 2008, and that's before the load shedding or blackouts, solar may have been looked at as a luxury good in your home. Um, some of the things that have pushed this away from a luxury towards becoming a almost necessity, I'll use that word, the technology prices for solar panels have decreased drastically. Solar panel efficiency has dramatically improved over time and panels continue to push to new limits each year. I noticed, in fact, on that note, there are now 810 watt solar panels that are in production. So that's quite a big solar panel compared to what you would have seen in the marketplace a few years ago. At the same time, the cost of going solar continues to drop for the household property owner. The graph at the bottom there just shows a typical five, six kilowatt system. And there's about a 60% drop from 2008 right down to 2018. We look at the battery technology, which can be looked at as the new gold. Um, the reason batteries are obviously quite popular is that they can store power. So the first battery that I'll look at is the lead or gel batteries, which are seen to be budget friendly, quite reliable or reasonably reliable. These are 12 volt batteries. They come either in 100 amp hours or 200 amp hours. You can get typically 1200 or 1200 cycles at a 50% depth of discharge. The picture on your left is a battery setup we had done for a private home owner who just wants battery backup because she works from home and cannot have the disruptions due to load shedding during the day when she's working. And in the evenings, if there's load shedding, she just needs to have her Wi-Fi, fridges running and uh, TVs going as well as lights. Just a basic overview of a popular lead stroke gel battery that we've seen in the marketplace is the 12 volt AGM battery from Vision. And these rechargeable batteries are lead dioxide systems with a dilute sulfuric acid. The electrolyte would be absorbed by separators and plates and immobilized. And should the battery be accidentally overcharged, producing hydrogen and oxygen, it's got valves that allow the gases to escape to avoid excessive pressure buildup, which also helps for safety. And then you don't have batteries exploding. The battery is completely sealed, maintenance free, leak proof and usable in any position. A few performance characteristics on this battery. It is a 12 volt battery with six cells inside, a design life of 12 years, and just a bit on the 25 degrees Celsius nominal capacity. At a 10 hour rate, you're getting about 100 amp hours if you push in 10 amps at 10.8 volts. At a five hour rate, you need to obviously close to double the current out, 17.4 amps at 10.5 volts. At the three hour rate with more amperes, you'd get about 26.6 amps 
and that would give you a capacity of 79 amp hours. And at a one hour rate, 65.2 amps with 9.6 volts. So it's a fully charged battery at 25% with an internal resistance of about 5.7 milliohms. And there's a 3% capacity decline per month at about 20, 20 degrees Celsius. The operating temperature range is between uh, at discharge minus 20 to 60 degrees Celsius, at charge 10 to 60 degrees and storage 20 to 60 degrees. The short circuit current and the discharge current, so that's 900 amps and 2,100 amps uh, consecutively. A maximum charging current of 30 amps and a standby use of 2.2 to 2.27 volts PC. Just a basic graph that shows the cycle life in relation to depth of discharge. So the depth of discharge just refers to, if you think of a battery as a bucket of water, how deep do you go into that bucket when you are using the battery? So the higher the number on the depth of discharge, so that means if you are closer to 100%, that means you're draining the battery at 100%. Um, the less cycles you get out of the battery and the less depth of discharge you drain the battery at, the more cycles you can get. So at 100% DOD or depth of discharge, you'd get about 300 cycles in this battery. At about 50%, you can range between 600 to about 800 cycles. And about 30% depth of discharge, you could pull that right across 1,200 to maybe about 1,500 cycles. So just the basic uh, simplification of that is, the less you drain the battery or the less depth you drain the battery at, the more you can get out of it in terms of reusable cycles. We look at the new gold as well, or another battery, a popular battery type, which is the lithium ion. That's probably a buzzword. Lithium ions are batteries used in electric vehicles, smartphones, um, probably the Apples and the Samsungs and the Huawei's. And these batteries are a lot more expensive. So if you budget conscious, you might be a bit more cringe towards the price of these batteries. But they do have a longer lifespan and larger cycles with a deeper depth of discharge of about 90%. These batteries come in 48 volts. They're 48 volt batteries in this case. You do get the 12 volt uh, lithium ions as well. And you can look at the 2.4 kilowatt hours, 3.5 kilowatt hours, and 4.8 kilowatt hours. The picture on the left is two times 2.4 kilowatt hours that we did for a client. A typical popular lithium ion battery is the Pylon Tech US 2000B. And that's just a lithium battery that represents the latest technological frontier for storage applications. So for battery storage for PV, which is your solar systems with a 10 year warranty. There's some simplicity and modularity because you can add these as you want. Um, so this is the 2.4 one, similar to the picture in the previous slide. You can implement them for small or large capacity storage systems. And this can be expanded to meet current and future needs. So what we've noticed is some clients will buy two batteries and maybe add the next uh, two batteries at a later stage, depending on budget, or maybe start off with one and add another one. And that's the benefit of having a modular system. The lithium iron phosphate technology has advantages because it's expandable at any time as each unit has its own BMS, battery management system. The internal molecular, molecular structure of these lithium batteries is more sta stable and safer. You can scale these batteries from about 2.4 kilowatt hours right up to 19.2 kilowatt hours. They are compact and modular, quite easy to install and upgrade as possible. And the advanced battery management system enables for real-time alarm notification. If there's um, the battery's running flat, if these, there's a huge current draining the battery and so forth. 
we then look at the hybrid inverter. The I like to call this the smart device to the general consumer or the brains of the system. The typical inverter sizes that we have seen in the market LSM, so the market types that we are operating in, have ranged from the 3 kVAs to the 10 kVAs. Inverters manage the charging current, the charging process of the batteries, the current, the currents um, in and out of the system, and power allocation per source, whether you get in your power at the time from the utility or from the solar panels or from the battery, the inverter manages that whole process. The picture on the left is just one of my installers setting up the completed inverter installation. A typical popular inverter that we've seen in the market is the Expact King, either the 3.2 kilowatt or 5.2 kilowatt, and that's a 48 volt MPPT maximum power point transfer solar inverter. In the picture there, you can see that it's got an option to get in the solar, possible generator, utility, battery coming in and pushes that all out to the home appliances, your typical TVs, fans, fridges, lights, and other appliances. Maybe let's throw in Wi-Fi, since we all work from home a lot more. Just a few specs I've pulled out from the user manual on the Expat King. Um, on the 3.2 kVA and the 5.2 kVA, it's a 230 volt, so this is the single phase inverter. You've got a low loss voltage of 110 volts, low loss retain voltage of about 120 volts, and a high loss voltage of 280, and a high loss return, volt, uh, volt, return voltage of about 270. The maximum uh, current coming in voltage is about 300 volts. The frequency is about 50 hertz, which is typical for South Africa, and ranges with the low loss of 46 and 46.5, and a high loss frequency would be 54. This inverter has a power factor greater than 0 0.98, with um, a line mode on the circuit breakers and on the battery mode, your electronic circuits. It's got a peak efficiency of about 94.5%, and if you look at the battery mode specs, it's a sine wave inverter, 230 volts again, output frequency of about 50 hertz, on the battery mode about 90% peak frequency, with some surge capacity rated power for five seconds. On the 3.2 kilovolt amps uh, inverter, that's a 24 volt um, um, inverter, the 5.2 kilowatt inverter is a 48 volt. So the cold start voltages would obviously differ. On the 3.2, the cold start voltage is 23. On the 5.2, the cold start voltage is 46. Low DC warning voltage, that means if your voltage is low, you've got 22.5 at 50%, load less than 50%, at greater than 50%, greater or equal to, that's 22 volts direct current. On the other side, on the 5.2, that low DC warning would come in at 45, at uh, loads less than 50%, and at loads greater than 50% at 44. Cutoff voltages on the battery, you've got a cutoff voltage at a load less than 50% of 21.5 volts. So if your battery shows less than that, it starts to cut off, so you start, you don't drain the batteries to zero and loads greater than 50% at 21.0. On the 5.2 kVA inverter at 43 volts and at 42 for loads greater or equal to 50%. At the solar charging mode on the MPPT, which is the maximum power point transfer type, you can get in 1,500 watts on your 3.2 kVA with 60 amps maximum charging current. So for 1,500 watts, that's about maybe three or four big solar panels between 330 watts to about 380 watts. On the 5.2, you can get in 4,000 watts so that with a maximum charging current of 80 amps. So that could be your typical 400 watt panels and having 10 of those or six or eight, 
we've noticed that the popular uh, configuration on the 5 kVA with the LSM we operate in is six solar panels, in fact, at a six times 380 watt panels or six times 400 watt panels. This has a solar charging efficiency of 98% uh, max with a maximum voltage of 145 volts. On the 3 kVA, you've got a PV voltage range of 30 to 115 volts in direct current. On the 5 kVA, you've got about 60 to 115 volts direct current. The maximum charging current is 120 amps on the three. On this is the joint utility and solar charge. And on the five is 140 amps. The default charge current will then default to 60 amps. So I go back to the question again. Is solar energy a luxury or a necessity? Those are just some pictures of a few installations recently clients who had thought this would be a luxury until they started working from home, it then started to be looked at as a necessity, especially with the battery backup. So typical costs for solar systems would be influenced by the house size, the number of appliances or the or appliances you'd like to put on the system, the preferred battery technology, be it lead acid gel or lithium iron, and of course, most importantly, the budget of the consumer. Your typical systems that we've been interacting mostly with are the three and five KVA systems. And if you look at the graphic on the left, you've got a three KVA system that goes for about 42,000 Rand XVAT. That's got the three times 360 watt solar panels, the three KVA inverter with the four 100 amp hour gel batteries, Typical small house, uh, TVs, lights, and fridges, Wi-Fi included as well. Option two, which seems to be our most popular one, is the six times 380 watt solar panels, five kVA uh, 48 volt inverter, four gel batteries with, on, with installation and accessories, which is right there, medium house to guide the consumer. So that's TVs, lights, fridges, and you can upgrade to a bigger system later by adding either more panels or once the lead or gel batteries have um, gone through their life, adding the lithium ion batteries. The slightly bigger system is option three, which is about 92,000 Rand, which has about eight times 380 watt solar panels, the five kVA inverter, and that has the 250 amp hour or two times 2.4 kilowatt hour lithium ion batteries slightly large houses. We see these mostly in your slightly more upmarket suburbs, large houses of maybe three, four, five bedrooms, TV slides, fridges, accessories, and they can add more batteries at a later stage. Why do I show you the costs? Because if you compare to what most people enjoyed spending money on, a typical 65 inch 4K QLED TV, today's price of the big shopping website goes for about 35,000 Rand. An Apple iPhone 11 is about 20,000 Rand. And if you add in a Samsung home theater system, that goes for about 8,000 Rand. If you add all that up, you've got about 50, 58,000 Rand. You could either get those items in December, but then if you don't have electricity to keep those on, what's the point? Or if you can't charge your phone or have the smart TV running in the background whilst having dinner or working from home. So we've seen a lot of consumers change their buying habits from, or buying decision, from buying the new latest electronics to either saving up or spending the money on the solar, solar system or the solar hybrid system with battery backup. Just a basic conclusion, um, energy security and electricity price has definitely made consumers think differently about where to spend their money. The predictability around electricity supply has started to become a lot more difficult. We've seen the governance issues in ESCOM, governance and corruption issues in the municipalities, the load shedding, the transformer and substation damages, 
and that has obviously influenced the general way of life. So in our view, solar energy has now moved from a household luxury to a soon to be need. And the industry may still be post infancy, meaning that not all houses have solar uh, products or systems. It is commercially tested and available. However, there's a lot of opportunities to be explored within the South African market. Thank you for your time. Those are just a few of our contact details. We are, or I am available on WhatsApp or call on that specific number, which is 076-539-9432. That's our email address. And we do have a YouTube channel that we've recently started called Sakisa Energy and Technology Group. I will now hand over back to Ezram, who will take it from there. Um, thanks a lot, um, uh, Eddie. Um, Thank you. Um, now, guys, uh, it's a it's a it's a time um, to for some questions. If we've got some questions, uh, I've got Stevilo will be um, <clears throat> assisting me with uh, with the with the questions. You can you can post all your questions in the in the in the questions tab on your control uh, panel. Uh, we have uh, enough time to run through most of the questions. Uh, let me take... Uh, uh, Good evening, everyone. Uh, like Ezra has said, I'm Stabile Ntombela. I'll just assist with the questions. I'll go straight to the questions. The first question is from Ayanda Noah. She's saying, from a cost point of view, what are you noticing as the price of batteries? As we know, uh, excuse me, sorry, let me go back. I've lost the slide. OK, I'm back now. Okay. She's actually asking, in the, from a cost point of view, what are, the, what are you noticing as the price of batteries? As we know that the solar system's biggest cost is in batteries. In other yes. words, is the cost of batteries coming down? Okay, I, I believe the cost of batteries is coming down. But what we've also seen is because there's been new entrants into the marketplace. So your more uh, exciting lithium ions and now the new inventions with the fuel cell batteries, the research and all of that. So the cost of batteries has started to decrease slightly. This is also linked to the rand dollar exchange though as well so if the rand isn't performing too greatly the importers stroke distributors of these batteries obviously the price then goes up and one of the things that we've noticed clients that uh, clients do is they'll probably start off with the gel batteries have their system running secure their electricity or energy supply and look at buying lithium iron at a later stage in a few years to come once that cost does go down or some clients might start off with two lithium iron batteries and uh, add it on in a modular approach thank you for that uh, the next one is from uh, boitumelo sislake uh, she wants to find out uh, for people renting apartments or even owning one what what is the existing solution for them since most of those built were built before 2010 and has no solar power mix okay so if you rent in an apartment you probably better off getting the portable battery box which i haven't shown they are either available on retailers or we do sell a few and that has your typical probably two times 12 volt batteries and it's a box that looks like a big uh, trunk that you can run an extension cable from. That's probably going to carry about 600 watts, between 600 and 1,200 watts. So free, uh, I'd probably recommend the TV, Wi-Fi, and two or three study lamps on that during load shedding, which you can then charge with the extension cable after the load shedding has ended. 
If you own the apartment, you should definitely then look at the battery backup. So that would be then a three KVA inverter. So this is probably a two or three bedroom apartment. Three KVA inverter with about maybe four batteries. Um, four gel batteries or one 24 volt lithium ion battery and you could wire that into your DB board. The challenge with renting is you don't want to get into a situation where you are wiring up your landlord's DB or main, main board and they have an issue with you once you vacate the premises regarding COCs, electrical compliance and all of that. So for a person who owns the apartment the battery backup seems to be very effective. And those start typically from about, oh, sorry about that, Stravile. Those, you can continue, uh, the, okay, and the small, so the smallest that we do for apartments, the wired in backups start typically at about 29,000 Rand. I just had to mention costs as well. Thank you for that, Eddie. The next one is from Mohammed Fayaz. Uh, his view is that uh, it's like a contradiction to claim to be tackling energy poverty, but focusing on system, regardless of the decrease in price that the poor or middle class cannot afford. This is only an option for the rich. It's his view, considering the capital outlay required for solar system, if not managed properly with the shift by the rich alternative energy, not in essence result in the cost of electricity for the poor increasing. All while this system still use the grid as a backup for when the sun does not shine. Okay, that's a very fair concern, uh, Mohammed, because obviously you have the lower end of society continuously suffering the bigger effects of any malpractices that we find in service delivery. What we've started to notice though, however, is that we recently did an installation in Soweto. Uh, the house was a two bedroom house, two bedroom, one lounge, one bathroom house, an old house. And the guy still spent about the three KVA solar system. So three panels and four gel batteries. The video should come up shortly on the screen behind me. And the reason for that, it costed him about 40 odd thousand rand, uh, 42,000 rand ex vat. And his reasoning was that being in Soweto and living with his parents, he can't afford to not have electricity now that he works from home. And as we are aware that the Soweto area has been affected by a few power blackouts lately. The bottom end of society, so maybe you're more poorer or impoverished, there are some uh, public sector programs that have been explored for things like your solar geysers, uh, your smaller solar systems, your DC current systems <clears throat> that power up maybe four to six lamps uh, lights. And I've seen a few RFPs or RFIs for the Eastern Cape province as well. But I do believe as time goes on and as potentially the technology starts to become more affordable or scalable in the lower sector, the lower levels of society, more and more business will start to flow there, whereby we could hopefully one day have systems or funding models that your lower LSMs can start to participate in, either through an installment programs or higher purchase or rent to buy uh, for smaller, much smaller panels and inverters, maybe one KVA inverters with uh, two times 12 volt batteries, possibly at a cost of about 15,000 Rand that the individual could pay off over time. It's things like technology, unfortunately, always come in from the higher end and trickle their way down. Similar to smartphones, um, six to, Probably eight to 10 years ago, your typical smartphone owner was obviously in the higher income bracket, but we start to see more and more people getting even your basic smartphones, um, having access to internet or using Wi-Fi in public transport or public areas. Um, I typically sometimes drive through Alexandra, which is not far from our office in Santon, 
and we start to see more and more people, most of the people have DSTV, um, some of most of the houses have solar geysers in the homes, the small homes, as much as they are small, they are smart TVs. So it's just a matter of time until these solutions are more scalable and uh, modular for that market. I wouldn't use the word greed per se, because at the end of the day, if a product is available on the market, if you can afford to access it for your own security, then that's fine. And that's the video of the house in Soweto. You can see he hasn't painted his roof in decades, but he opted to go for solar first. So more and more members of the lower end of society are inquiring or researching solar options as well. Um, okay, uh, Eddie, uh, there's another question here. Are there innovative financial models such as rent to own types? And also, uh, how is the local manufacturing opportunities for, for these systems? The question comes okay. from Rudy Sono. Okay, all right. Uh, hi, Rudy. The financing options that we've seen uh, briefly, we haven't had any clients through finance as yet. Um, you could, if you have a house, tap into the equity on your bond. So you could either speak to your bank. So if you've had your house maybe for about six or seven years and there's a bit of equity sitting there and maybe you need to pull out about 70,000 Rand for home improvement, you could look at that option and say to your bank, hey, I need to pull out some money from my bond. I want to access that and buy some solar. Typical to how most people use that money to renovate or some for December spending. Um, we haven't come across very much a lot of innovative financing solutions in the residential side. In the commercial side, however, there's different options with the PPAs and rent to buys and etc. Another challenge on the financing side with residential, because although it may seem like a large or medium to large capital outlay for the consumer, um, financial institutions typically may not get a lot of um, cream for the, the actual transaction amount. So you looking at about, say, let's just work with the 66,000 Rand. And if you had to build in or pack in some interest on that over time with a medium term loan, it might not be feasible as yet due to high interest rates linked to prime Obviously, you're not going to get prime, or you might not be lucky enough to get prime if you weren't for a medium-term loan outside of your bond. And you'd probably be better off just paying for a credit card and just paying off the system and working off your credit card. Okay, no, thanks for, for the for the for the answer, Eddie. Uh, there's another question here from a guy who is um, uh, actually, uh, he wants to know about the safety aspect of the installation. Uh, how is this covered in the OSH Act? Then please clarify the ethene and the lightning protection of the installation. I'm not sure that okay. you are that technical to, to answer that, but yeah, that's what it's asking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's actually a very good question. So the solar system that we like to install, we oh, first of all, there are a lot of installers or people who may install unsafe installations. So what's important is that the solar system needs to be earthed. So you would obviously earth the panels and railings on the roof and run the earthing cable or wire, aluminum or copper down into the ground on the side of the house and earth it properly. So that should lightning strike or should there be current issues, it is earthed correctly. Another important thing as well is to have the right fuses and circuit breakers in the various combiner boxes. So should there be an issue with voltage or current coming from the DC solar into the inverter, the inverter does not pack up or get blown up or get uh, blown, that's the better word. And also some fuses and breakers between the utility and the inverter and between the inverter and the house. So that's the AC combiner box. So having all those fuses and breakers protects your main DB from any issues that may arise from the solar system. 
So you'd rather have the fuse go first and replace a fuse, which is a cheap product, as opposed to burning a few things further. Um, solar installations do come with electrical certificates of compliance. And I do understand that there's an organization called Subfia, which is obviously looking to formalize uh, solar installations a bit more. I'm just not too sure how far they are with regards to that. Um, so as the market matures more, you might find there might be a little bit more paperwork with regards to the residential installations. What we've also seen is some of the clients we've had have been rectify, rectifying work or rectifying jobs. So there may be an installer who has just come in and taken a chance and put two or three panels on the guy's roof, use the incorrect cabling, no fuses, no breakers, and just incorrectly connected the batteries to the inverter to the house. And um, just so that the client could see that there's something on the roof and he gets paid and runs away. So with safety, it's also important to do your due diligence on the person who's providing you with the solar and also investigate the products that they offer because you also want to have inverters and batteries and solar panels that are tier one or high quality to avoid having problems at a later stage. Okay, Eddie, uh, I just want to point out something. Uh, I okay. see that, uh, um, no, I'm just saying, Ayanda Noah was very asking, so she was very interactive. So thank you, Ayanda, wherever you are. Thank you for, for the questions. Uh, so Eddie, uh, somebody which uh, you didn't, uh, they want to know if the system is grid tight, uh, does it come on, on and off automatically? What happens when the power goes off? I think it's Ashley who wants to know that. Okay, hi Ashley. I'm assuming you're saying grid tied, meaning it's connected to the grid. So the price I showed are for hybrid systems. So the inverters move current, I think at about 10 microseconds. So if there's load shedding, you wouldn't notice based on the stuff that's okay. connected to the system. So it's constantly moving between solar battery utility, solar battery utility, or solar utility battery. Um, so if the power comes on and off, you wouldn't see a change. Obviously your stove would stop working, maybe your microwave and kettle, depending if those are on or off the system, but your TVs, lights, fridges wouldn't change in frequency. Okay, um, thanks Eddie. Um... There's one question here um, from Tin. Uh, she left Tiniso. Um, she's saying that uh, one prof from that once raised a concern with respect to SSEGs, which is energy sprawl. How yes. are you aligning your installation with the metro development patterns? Mm. All right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, so the I understood it. It's good. Okay, so the SSEG, the SSEG, the small scale embedded generation, um, oh, I think okay. that's set to be a big industry. Um, in my view, um, obviously there is a concern with the sprawl, uh, safety issues, quality issues, um, probably post COVID businesses just creeping up in various industries. So what we've seen is we prefer to align ourselves with clients who want to pride themselves on building a relationship with their service provider. So in the residential sense, um, typical clients that we liaise with are not always just chasing price or sprawling for price. It's more about, can we trust this, install this installer? Um, do they seem to know what they're talking about? Do they take my calls post installation? So with regards to the sprawl, it's not very easy to predict where things will be in the future, like with regards to energy security. Um, you do have microgrids also becoming a thing. Um, so there might be more decentralization of electricity supply as time goes on, as more developments also happen within our main utility being ESCOM. So I cannot control what may happen in the macroeconomy, but with regards to the microeconomy, 
with regards to how we sprawl, if that's the right word to use, is we prefer to build relationships with clients who see the value for the service. Okay, thank you, Eddie. Uh, Stavile, any questions that you see? Okay, thank you for that. Uh, there's another question from uh, Ayanda. She's asking if for an installation uh, package that you uh, spoke about, I mean, the, in, the prices that you spoke about doesn't include the installation and also how long does the installation take from installing to getting it to work? Okay. Yes, the prices include installation, Ayanda. They include all the switch gear, which is your fuses, breakers, etc., panels, everything on the roof, brackets, railings, inverters, and batteries, depending on which package you choose or option. And typical installations of those size should be a day. If it takes two days, there's either a delay with regards to the wiring or the rewiring of the DB, the DB board. Maybe we have to split a few circuits, add a breaker or two to separate maybe the microwaves and kettle circuit from the fridge circuit, depending on the type of house you have as well. So work with a day or two and the prices do include installation. Okay, thanks, Let's... Eddie. Uh, Alan, oh, sorry, Stavile. Alan want to know if your inverter has a guarantee, but I'm thinking maybe also guarantee warranties. Yes, definitely, yes. They have warranties, uh, two years plus. Uh, batteries can be two years plus. Lithium ions can be five or 10 years, depending on the product. Solar panels, lifespan, I think it's about, it's sitting at 20 to 25 years. Okay. Uh, Stavile? The next one is from Katleho. Uh, he's saying, look at looking at the uncertainty of the relation in relation to the weather patterns. So, how best do you think the system can be optimized for maximum power output? That's also a very good question. So, luckily, South Africa has a very good uh, solar uh, energy resource, meaning we've got a lot of sun across the country or parts of the country that I've been to. So if you have uh, cloudy days or dark and gray cloudy days, then you'd be switching over to the utility and battery. So the because you've got the three options, which is a hybrid system, you've got the solar, the battery and the utility, you can plug into one of the three or the inverter can draw power from one of the three. Um, some clients have gone the paranoid route I like to call it that, but also sometimes necessary, and added up maybe a small backup generator to the solar. So meaning they budget for a cloudy set of days, maybe three or four days in a row, no sun, no electricity and flat batteries, and they can start the, the generator. They haven't yet been in a situation like that. The nice thing or the unfortunate nice thing is that our load shedding is still between four to eight hours depending on which stage it is so if you've got a bit of sun during the day you could power your house up during load shedding or if the load shedding starts at night you could run the batteries at night and if they do run flat in the middle of the night they can start up again when the power comes back so at this point in time of the game the solar battery and utility seems to be a viable option as well okay Okay, uh, no, uh, thanks, Eddie. Uh, I just wanted to comment on something that uh, Mohamed uh, wrote about uh, um, this being an alternative option for the poor. Um, yes, it is. For me, it is an alternative option for the for the uh, for the alternative option for the rich. Yes, it yes. is an alternative option for the rich, but. Uh, you must also look at it in terms that if more rich people have solar, so that means you are not placing strain on ESCOM. So the very same poor you are advocating for, they will get the, the energy. Because if now all the rich people are still relying on ESCOM, now we have a problem. ESCOM cannot supply. We are going into um, load shedding. And if I just go back a few years ago, the first smartphones, that came out, smartphones were not the cheapest phones. They were exactly, actually very yes. expensive. But if yes. you look at it now, the price have actually went down 
So yes. every, even the poor guy has a smartphone. So we can yes. start here with the price being high, but in the next five, 10 years, we will be able to drop the prices down for an ordinary middle class and poor person to be able to afford this. Yes. Thanks. And the slide I had shown with the TV screens and the iPhone and the soundbar, what we've seen is middle class individuals um, can afford solar. Definitely. Um, Yes, they not taking the ninety thousand rand package. They're looking at maybe sixty thousand or forty two thousand. Um, we've noticed that it's just a, a buying decision. So you probably have uh, couples who might have had a budget to buy a new TV uh, with a new sound system, and then sitting down together and saying, instead of buying a new TV and sound system, let's buy solar. Or in some cases instead of buying that new kitchen unit they'd rather opt to buy some solar and battery backup because then at least they can still keep the lights on on an existing kitchen unit that they might be able to do in a few years to come um and you're definitely right Ezra. Um, as prices do decrease we will definitely see more market entry yes um okay uh Stabile, i'm not sure if you are seeing any question um i'm seeing there was a question about using an old battery uh using old battery and new battery doesn't compromise the efficiency of the system it does because then you need various charge controllers depending on um oh you mean old of the same battery uh so i prefer to recommend that if you buy say your batteries today the same, keep the type of battery the same. If you go in lithium ion and it's modular, then you can obviously add as you go along because those are quite smart batteries. But if you had like a 10 year old or a five year old battery um, and you buy a new battery today, that might be a different story because the voltages might be different, the specs are not the same. So it's nice to maintain uniformity the same with solar panels. If you have a certain wattage of solar panels on your roof and you want to add more, try add the same of that panel as you add on, because then you don't have to get different charge controllers to manage the different voltages, because obviously different products uh, perform differently. Oh, OK. Um, yeah. Uh... T set, so I think he had a, I'm not sure we went to T set. So we've got two minutes. Uh, let me see T set's question. Using the analogy of DSTV and smartphone that were previously accessible to the high income earners of the society, those have since trickled down to the low end of the spectrum, mainly be oh, okay. That was okay. We will send you this question and then you will reply to T uh, set because so, I see it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit longer. Um, okay. So I'm not sure if Stevile sees, we've got like two minutes left. Uh, Stevile, do you see any question? Okay, there's one that just came in now uh, from Wilfred. It says, how do you estimate or fix or package while the number of uh, components, number of panels and batteries depend on each individual solar load profile? Okay, good question. So we first estimate in the initial discussion. So we'll ask, okay, how big is your house? What sort of appliances are you putting on there? Uh, where's your house? What type of roof do you have? How many TVs, fridges, lights? What sort of lights? Do you have LED lights? Do you have old school lights? Do you have CCTV, electric fans? <clears throat> What's your price range or your budget? And then after that, we do a site visit where we go see the house. Uh, look at the roof, look at the electricity bills, look at the layout of the DB board, et cetera, et cetera. And then we get into slightly more detailed. So we can either add panels or subtract or change the battery systems as well. Uh, okay. Um, Eddie, um, uh, thank you very much for a good presentation. Uh, I see that a lot of people uh, are interested in the topic. And I guess it's also because of the load shading that we are going through. And you are right, in the every part of the world, they use the word blackout, so it's not the word load shading. Uh, <laughs> so any questions that we couldn't go through, we will take it and then send it to, to, to Eddie, and then Eddie will um, respond. 
Uh, but uh, thank you for attending the, the talk today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, please visit the SIE website uh, on www.sie.org.za for upcoming uh, webinars. Um, I will call it an evening. Thank you. Thank you.